We got into Pergamum a little bit, and um, that's um, Revelation chapter 2, and beginning with verse 12. Um, but I wanted to point out a few things in verse 13. Um, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my, uh, my faith, even in those days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. <clears throat> All right. So, Pergamon. What are the problems that assailed them from the outside? Um, well, they dwelt where Satan's throne is. Would that be a problem for Christians? Just check it. All right. Verse 13, some of them were killed. Um, what kind of problems did they have? Well, some of them, because it says some of them hold the doctrine of Balaam, and they also have Nicolaitans or Nicolaitans among them. <clears throat> and um, so we're beginning to see uh, a pattern here of certain things. Let's see, I'm looking back into... Uh, in Smyrna, it says that there were those who blaspheme saying they were Jews when they're not, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. This one says that they're of the throne of Satan, and what we're going to find in the next couple <clears throat> is that some 60 years after the glorious resurrection of Christ, the church is assailed by every kind of problem. And, and, and when you take it as a whole, you're hearing every kind of problem. And you're hearing um, that instead of Satan being far from them, he's, you know, he's right there, has people right there in the midst. And not only that, but these folks dwell, I mean, the wording there is, is pretty powerful. Um, where is it here? Um, verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. And the last part of that verse says, where Satan dwelleth. All right. Um, some people have problems with demons. You know, they're either oppressing them or possessing or, pro you know, whatever. However, you know, these people were having a problem with Satan himself. Okay. And these are Christians. And this is the third church mentioned and the other two weren't that much better off because they had all sorts of things going on so that the description, and we're, we're gonna see this, you know, after, after this one, I'll start, you'll, you'll start noticing it more. We're, we're gonna see that when you take the church as a whole through the seven churches, there are major things going on that the picture that you get of the church <clears throat> isn't that everything's, everybody's healed and every miracle has happened constantly and uh, the enemy is so scared of the light of, of Christ that they put forth that he's far away. And they're just living in this wonderful world where God does everything for them and he covers them and he protects them and there are no problems and there are none. Instead, you're getting a very ugly picture. Well, <clears throat> anyone that truly lives for the Lord and has Christ within them and lives by that life is going to understand why. 
because the darkness hates the light. Okay. And um, you, you get a picture of that with, uh, with, with the great red dragon, Satan, with his main man. And what's he called? <clears throat> uh, yeah, he's called the beast. He's called the, he's called the Satan lover or the dragon lover. No, he's called the Antichrist. Because his main government is not toward Satan and satanic worship and satanic. I mean, ha haven't you ever thought that it's a little strange that you don't see more Satan churches and satanic worship? And do, I mean, do, you know, anybody ever thought about that? It's like, you know, I know that it's out there, but I'm just saying, that, doesn't it seem a little strange that, you know, that you don't see more of that stuff? Well, I'll tell you why, because that's not his motivation. His motivation is anti. You know, it would be nice if he was at least for something. You could at least distract him. <laughs> but he's anti, specifically, not anti-Christianity. He's never called anti-Christianity. In fact, he could probably use it. But he can't use Jesus. And he is anti-Christ. And when he finds him, he doesn't run in the other direction. He antis him. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? He antis him because that's what he is. That's his makeup on the inside. And, the, and these churches at this stage, and we'll get into it more, but these churches probably feel like they're not very much of God. When in reality... And, they, and yet they do have problems, and yet so does every earthen vessel. If it, it would be a golden vessel if it was, didn't have any problems. It would be pure gold. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God, not of the earthen vessel. And that's God's plan, and that's how he's proceeding. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, what are the problems they assailed with? Well, they dwell where Satan's throne is. Hmm. What else? Some of them were killed. Um, what kind of problems do they have? Some hold the doctrine of Balaam. They also have Nicolaitans. What is the answer? What is the answer? He that overcometh. Now, I just would like to say that if you knew what the Lord meant by that, you would be jumping and shouting right now. But you think that overcoming is when the devil knocks you down, you eventually rise up and strangle him to death. And that's what you think overcoming is, because that's what we're taught overcoming is in churches. Uh, many churches that you know you need to be an overcomer you know you need to you need to become an overcomer to such a point that you don't ever have any problems that you walk above every problem that there is never a situation where the devil is actually getting the victory over God's people and even though I know it says he, and they killed Antipas right there among you and all this stuff but uh, you know well my conclusion to that is is that there may be a lot of people that are serving the Lord that are going through all kind of stuff and since that's the teaching that they've had they think they're a failure my question is but what is Jesus's view of the situation well that's what this class is about <laughs> there's good news <laughs> that's what this class is literally about okay let's go to Thyatira um, this is still chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 18, and this is church number 4. <clears throat> and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. Anybody remember that? That's, that's the revelation of himself that he presented to them before as it were, before they got into all this, if you understand, because that was prior to this, before they got into this, 
And so now that same one that was supposedly revealed to them is having to come back on the basis of his revelation, of the revelation of his own being, and speak to them concerning overcoming. The name of the book is not Revelations. I know you hear people say that all the time. But turn to the book of Revelations. It's not. It's the book of Revelation. And, and he identified it in the first verse, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And the problem is not that these churches are going through, is not the end times. The problem is they have not grasped the revelation of him as he was. And again, one reason why they haven't is because they're trying to figure out the objects like this is some sort of a uh, myster mysterious puzzle. Um, you know, the Da Vinci Code. And you have to find this object and then turn it and then put it into that and then this does that and, and, and then one, and you know, we love a mystery so oh my God, you know, this is better than uh, I was the Hardy Boys and what's her Drew Nancy Drew <clears throat> you know because this is really cool because I love mysteries and I love Jesus so I'm just gonna let this hook slide right into my mouth and just you know it's not yeah it's a mystery but the mystery Paul said in in Colossians 1 27 26 27 28 the mystery is Christ in you the hope of glory which was hid from generations well guess what quit trying to find the mystery and find the person now of the mystery and the person of the mystery John at least heard the voice and didn't go oh the Lord just spoke to me praise God I just heard something from God this is one of the best days of my life this year anyway and oh praise the Lord no he turned to see what it was that was talking to him he wanted to see not just hear I don't want to just hear from you I want to see you amen <clears throat> But apparently maybe they didn't turn to see. And so the one who has the seven stars or the sword or the, all this stuff is having to say, thus saith the one that was presented, but seeing, having eyes you see not. Not, not having eyes you see not the mystery of the code. <laughs> having eyes. You're not seeing me. You're searching and seeking for everything else in the Bible but me. He said it from the very first to the Ephesians. You've left your first love. You're trying to figure everything out, but you're not coming to me to see me. What is it, John 5, 39? You search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me, but you will not come to me that you might have life. We want to know mysteries. We don't want to live life. Especially his life. I'll live my life for God learning mysteries. I'll be deep. <clears throat> Praise God. Well, oh, I have things I could say, but the Lord is gracious. All right. Did I finish even reading all this one on Thyatira? I don't think I did. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> let's just start it again. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God who hath his eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and love and service and faith and thy patience and thy works, hmm. <clears throat> and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou allowest that woman, Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants and to commit fornication and to eat those things which are sacrificed unto idols. Oh my God, this is the second time that's been mentioned. Did you know that? It was mentioned earlier. I think it was Smyrna, but I can't remember, but it was one of those. That, they, that same thing. 
that they were eating those things which were sacrificed to idols. Oh my God! Oh no! Oh, you people, you're idol worshiping. You're anybody remember First Corinthians, the class we had on First Corinthians? Anybody remember going over the whole chapter for it over and over and over? And what was the issue there? The issue was there is no God, there is no idols. It's plain in the Bible. So what he cannot be saying, what Jesus could not possibly be saying here is. You're worshiping idols. He, 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 Paul calls those the weak, and God doesn't enter that category. He's not part of that weak group. The problem with eating those things offered to idols is that you're putting yourself and your rights and your privileges first, and that Jezebel does the same thing, and she's talking you into it. Now, if you, if you never had Christ revealed in 1 Corinthians 8 or Romans 14, which are both basically the same subject and stuff, then you would assume, because you never saw what he was talking about, that here Jesus is condemning eating things offered to idols when in reality he has made it absolutely clear that there are no gods other than the one true God, there are no idols, that there's nothing unclean of itself, da 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 but the problem he said I have with you, you who think that you're strong because you can do this and know the word of God, you're using the word and you're using the truth to stand up for your own rights and get what you want instead of laying down your life the way Jesus did for you when you were weak and when you were without hope. Well, these are the weak now and you're supposed to have my life. Well, that's a, that's a situation, folks, of leaving the gospel, of leaving the cross, of leaving the truth of Christ in you and saying, well, I'm just going to be religious and won't eat things offered to idols. That's not it or worse than religious, religious fear. Oh my God, if I do that, it's not what it's talking about. And you can be assured that if that's not, then most of this other stuff, the way we read it with our fearful, scared minds, because, and it's, I dealt with this a couple of classes ago already here in Revelation, because we assume that God is out to get us because we have failed and he's going to punish us because we didn't go after him the way we should have. Or, and I said in that class, God is not ever going to punish you. Not if you're a child of God. He will discipline you as his child. It will not be almighty God and you a sinner. Those days are over. Guess what? This is weird, but you got saved. You're in the family. You know. That was, I know that fear. We all know that fear. Every one of us that was a sinner that came, we came to who? God Almighty. And we said, I repent. I'm a sinner. And please forgive me. And, you know, we asked Jesus in our heart. We may not have really fully understood that we were born again and that we changed families and that we now, now he's no longer the almighty God, the judge that is out to get us. He's our father. And not only do we have our father who, you know, is on our side, but we have an advocate with the father. So it didn't say we have an advocate with Almighty God who he'll slap, he wants to slap you down really bad. But don't worry, we got an advocate. See, we, live, we still live in all that fear as if we never got saved. We don't see the value of being put to death by the cross. We don't see the value of therefore being raised up in oneness with Christ and therefore bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. We don't see the value of, of oneness and what it and the new and the completely new outlook it gives us. We don't go, oh my God, I've got to go. You know, remember the Wizard of Oz and I had to go in there and Almighty, oh, I am Almighty Oz and the cowardly line goes, <laughs> you remember all that's that's us on the inside when we think, oh no, you know, I know why this, this is happening bad. God's punishing me. No, he's not. He's disciplining you to bring you back into him, into oneness, into a reality of you being a son of God by Christ. <clears throat> 
And, you know, I would say a huge portion of of Christians have never even gotten past that. Just imagine, I mean, just imagine really knowing the Lord. I mean, how are you really going to know the Lord if you think that, you know, he's out to get you and that every failure you do now is on the same basis as if you were a rank sinner? You know? You know, I mean, I remember when my kids were little and <clears throat> they'd be playing and, you know, they'd be playing with some other kids and stuff like that. And, uh, I, we ran a daycare in that blue house when it was in another location and I was the head director me and my wife directed it together and I would go out in the backyard and my kids were there in the daycare with us and and uh, if one of the if one of the other kids did something wrong I'd say hey get away from me stop doing that right now they go oh, it's the director if my children did it, I didn't go, well, that's my children. I got to treat them sweet. And I'd say, hey, get away and stop doing that to my own kids. And they would go, yes, daddy. They didn't go, oh, it's the director. He's going to get us. I don't even know this man, but he's, he's older and he's a guy in running a daycare. It's scary. My girls knew that their daddy would not, you know, do what the imaginations of little children think. Because they had, their conscience had been cleansed by reality, <clears throat> by the fact of blood cleanses. That means Jesus bore the punishment. Does this make sense to anybody? I mean, that, that, that the blood cleanses our conscience. Well, so, so, what, so how do we spell that out? You know, how do we set that one in order? Well, you got this invisible conscience, and it's sort of in your head. And the blood of Jesus, which we can't see, uh, somehow gets applied. And it's like God dips his hand in the blood and then he sticks it through your skull you know and then he just and he cleanses your conscience and and that's how we're made free <laughs> the blood of jesus cleanses your conscience because your conscience is afraid because fear hath torment of uh, and is scared of punishment. And punishment has already been meted out to Jesus on the cross for everything you ever did. And you will never be punished because God settled it and he did it. And he did it for every sin that you committed. So why, what's he going to do? Punish Jesus and then go, well, you did it. And, you know, I, you just hacked me off today. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to break. I'm going to break the order and I'm just going to punish you. It, it's not, it doesn't happen. The blood, when, when you, it's not, and he doesn't take the blood and wipe your conscience down with it. Your heart and your spirit identify with Christ in his death and in the reality of just the actual um, fact that that blood means that he died and was punished and I'm my conscience is clean of that now my father will deal with me I mean he he'll spank me but whom he loves he chastens see that's a that's a father and notice those scriptures all talk about if your sons in Hebrews the ones we're talking it says if your sons then guess what He's going to deal with you as sons. He doesn't say he's going to deal with you as sinners or, you know, really, you're just a really messed up person, aren't you? You know, I mean, my, my father and then my stepfather came along and they were just, they were just mean-spirited. They were mean. I, I, and, I, and in that meanness there was, was cruelty, enjoyment in, in tormenting and, and stuff. So... For me, you know, when I came to God, you know, God's your father. Oh, my God. You know, I don't know. I'm not more of this, you know. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you wonder where some people, you know, start calling God 
by feminine. So a lot of men have caused that, you know. But he's not. He's the true. He's the true. You understand? He's the true. He's the real deal. And he convinced me. He convinced me. And he convinced me by certain things. And one of the things was, number one, the blood. Why would he do that? Why would he punish his own son for mine? Because he's trying to make me a son. And he's taking that off of me so I can get past simple salvation and sins and messing up and running from God. You say, is this really what this class is going to be about? <laughs> is this as deep as it's going to get? I think it's good stuff. No, no, we're, go we're going somewhere. But this is the second time in the course of this class that the Lord has stopped me as a pastor to deliver this. And I sense it as a pastor that somebody needs to hear it. And I will, uh, you know, I don't care what the lesson is or how anything appears. I will stop everything to deliver what's on the heart of the Lord to his people. And so, so I'm just telling you that this thing... Uh, that, that worries that God is, you know, that every time, you know, that if you mess up or you don't go all the way the way you think you need to go. You know what? Let me ask the question. I can kind of see Kelly back there. Is all the Iris still on here? Is Alana still on there? Alana! Part of this is for you, girlfriend. <laughs> it's for you. Because we think that God, that if we're, if we get off and everything, that that's the end of it. Yeah, right. Well, maybe it is with a, a God that doesn't care anything about us and sees us as wicked and evil and all this stuff. But if you're God's child, if you're in the family, he is working everything, even if he has to chastise you, to bring you back to him. And, and I tell you what, <clears throat> I believe that so strong that I believe that if I ever got off my father has never changed his mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? That he's never once changed his mind. And he's going to keep working according to his plan, regardless of my do 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 You know, you know the, a perfect example of that is Abraham. Oh, yeah, the father of faith. You know, the great Abraham. Uh, this guy got off. He, he ended up, you know, bringing forth Ishmael with Hagar. And once Ishmael was born... 13 years passed before God spoke to Abraham. Okay. So you either know the truth or you don't. And if you do, then you go, well, I don't know why he's not talking to me. But he knows. And I'm his child. And his blood has covered me, so this can't be punishment. Anybody following me? So 13 years later, God shows up. Abraham falls on his face, and what does God say? Well, he says, yeah, my covenant is with you. Uh, I can't remember the exact words, but the exact words are even better when he basically says, I haven't changed a bit. I haven't. I haven't changed my mind. I'm the same. Everything is exactly the same. Now let's get on with the plan. Yes. Right. <clears throat> I'm getting a few amens over here on this side. I... <laughs> Good. Amen. Well, and Alana, this isn't just for you, but, but this, is, this is for me. And to all those who will hear what the Spirit says to the church. And one of the things that really had these guys messed up is stuff like this. That they didn't grasp certain things that helped you pass through those things. You know, I mean, uh, somebody once said to me, I'm going through hell. And I said, well, keep going. <laughs> you know, until you get through it. You know, I said, yea, though I walked, the, you know, but he said, I'm going there. I said, well, keep going. You'll come out on the other side and you'll come out with Jesus. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So um, these, you know, these things, 
they seem basic and, and, and in a certain sense they are, but they're the foundation upon which you're going to build everything else. Because, okay, let's just consider this. Let's consider that later on down the road you come to a revelation of Christ in relationship to uh, or Christ in you. But then you mess up and you know it wasn't Christ in you. And then you start being separated from God and pushed away and thoughts start assailing you. And you start feeling further and further and you start feeling more wretched. Anybody following this? Even though you know Christ is in you, you didn't get something settled that keeps you with him. See, because you go, well, Christ is in me, but I'm the earthen vessel. And boy, did I earthen out yesterday. You know what I'm saying? And, and therefore, God, now God's just out to get me. And so, you know, if we don't hear anything from the Lord, we have no clue that maybe, maybe, you know, we got a little more dull of hearing, you know. But, it, but he's still speaking. I mean, I've always believed, you know what? I've believed that almost from the beginning, that if I can't hear God, it's not because he ain't talking. <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, he cares. He's, he's with me. He's, you know, I'm, duh, okay, but I'm still with you. And, and I, so many times, I would feel the pleasure of the Lord when I would do that because I'd just go, you know, duh, you know, look, uh, it, the problem, I'm sure the problem's with me. I'm not blaming you. I am with you, though, and I know you're trying to talk, and I know that you will keep working because you are faithful and true, and it's going to be written on your vesture, and you're going to eventually, you're going to bring me into all of this good land that you promised to bring us into, and I just happen to have faith, and I'm going to stand with you. I'm, I'm not going to get on the opposite side and start joining the, the rock throwers at you. I'm with you, Lord. And, and the, the, here's the amazing thing. I believe that if I did get on the rock throwing side against the Lord for a period of time, he still hasn't changed. And that, you know, one day I'll go, you know what? I just remembered. <laughs> I know it's been seven years. <laughs> But I'm your son, and you're my dad, and we're one, and Jesus died for it, and you have forgiven me. He's not going to have to die again. It's already done, and I'm just going to throw myself in, uh, in your lap and just hug you, you know. And we always think he's going to go, no, you're not, you know, like the prodigal son. No, you unclean, foul thing. No, first you got to repent. Well, that's what he thought. He thought. He thought that. No wonder he wandered off. He didn't have it down. So he comes back and goes, I'm going to repent and I'm going to tell him I'm not worthy. And before he gets any of that out of his mouth, the father's already run over to him, throw his arms around him, put a robe on him as if he's elevated, put a ring on him as if he's elevated, put shoes on his feet as if he's elevated, because he is. He's already raised up, made to sit together. Treating him like the son yes. that he is, one with Christ. Matter of fact. And the father doesn't even really give him a chance to, you know. He takes him in, sacrifices a sacrifice, showing that, look, this is already done. There's already been a sacrifice. Let's enjoy it now instead of, you know, freaking out over it, you know. And honor, honor the sacrifice, and honor the Father's heart, and honor the Father's house. It's all, it's all just, you know. And he, and he didn't honor it on his way back. He didn't honor it when he got to the Father. He honored it later as he saw the Father shoving the ring and kissing him and, you know, putting a robe on him and going, my God, this is... This is as if I never sinned. This is even above I never sinned. This is, this is higher than that. Well, it's sonship. It's oneness with Christ. This is, this is incredible. And he began, so he began to get the picture and go with the Father and go, oh, my God, oh, my God. And so by the time the sacrifice had been done, they went in there and rejoiced and ate over it. And went, ah, you know, and, and then the elder son's out there going, well, this ain't right. This ain't right. I have never done anything wrong. Well, if you think that's the basis, you are real messed up. Um, to whom is forgiven much, loves much. And what, what I get from that is, with all the junk, all my failures and everything, 
And my father still loves me and still puts his arm around me and still rejoices and laughs with me as we eat the sacrifice, the communion. Uh, you know, all I know is because I've been forgiven much, I just love him. But I don't just love much him, I love others. Because others fail. And that's not the time to turn around and to start pointing out their failures. That's the time to go put the robe on them and the ring on them and the shoes on them and, and declare the reality of Christ. And maybe they'll hear it and go, oh my God, just like the son did with the prodigal son did with the father. Does this make sense? And then go, oh my, you know? And all of a sudden they, it's like a dream. We were those they who dreamed that says they were the captives in Babylon. They sat by the river Chabar, wasn't it? And, and, but we were as they that dreamed, wherever that scripture is. He's talking about being able to see God's reality in the midst of a terrible captivity. And to go, oh, this is like a dream. This is, well, you know why it's like a dream? Because we know it. It's like, oh, I know this dream. Oh, my God, this is the, this is the way it's supposed to be. I, you know, okay, I got off from it. I'm back. <laughs> Read it. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, gay, we wept, when we remember Zion, we hung our hearts. Is that the one? That's not the one. Um, how should we Okay, well, let's move on. I, I pray, Father, I just ask that whatever people and whatever purposes you've had, I know that this is refreshing. Uh, Lord, hopefully it's pouring in the oil and the wine on those that have been beat up. Um, Jesus, you paid it all. We love you. We love you. We love you, Jesus. And we appreciate you. And we appreciate your heart in this. And Father, we appreciate your view. Help us to constantly come in more and more to your view so that we don't have to live in fear. So that we don't have to fear punishment. So that any negative thing that happens to us doesn't have to be read in light of punishment for failures. But we can just crawl up in your lap, even in the midst of it, and just confirm and, and affirm our love for you and our faith in your heart. Father, we just pray that you'll continue to uh, pour in the oil and the wine of your word of this sweet, sweet book called Revelation that we can actually find you and find you in a way that maybe we've never heard you presented out of this book. Lord, our, our hearts yearn, yearn for your gates, your courts. We yearn for your courts. That's the one thing we desire, that we could dwell in your house all the days of our life. And Lord, beyond that, even though David was sure-hearted and true, in the new covenant we yearn that we would dwell as the house of the Lord all the days of our lives and not as our own house. That we may see everything that goes on in that house, just like the servants of Solomon did. And they would see the wisdom and the compassion of Solomon and the decisions, the incredible other decisions that he would make day in and day out. They were blessed 
to be in the presence of such wisdom, and yet not just wisdom, but wisdom that was so other, so, so different, so full of life and love. And so, Lord, we, we seek you. We hunger after you. We ask you to break through our walls and break through our preconceived ideas and help us, Lord. Even as you declare to the seven churches, you think you're rich and clothed and really you're naked and blind. So, Father, we ask you, we ask you in Jesus' name, open our eyes to our true state and then open our eyes to our state as one with you. And may that become precious beyond all things to us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.